stand with me, please, for the reading of God's Word? Reading in, in, in Luke chapter 21, beginning in verse 20. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let those who are inside the city depart. And let not those who are out in the country enter it. For these are days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. Alas for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days. For there will be great distress upon the earth and wrath against this people. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among the nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Let's pray together. Our Father, <clears throat> once again, we thank you for this unfailing and infallible word that you have given. Father, we thank you that while this is a message of judgment and not easy for someone to preach and not easy for others to hear. It is you who have given it, and it is to be taken in all seriousness. And so we pray that you will prepare our hearts to receive that which you have for us today. Um, we are not, Father, as believers, exempt from the hard things that sometimes come not by way of judgment, but simply by way of life. And it seems, Lord, at the moment that we have been inundated with trials of various kinds, physical, deaths, loss of loved ones, sometimes very young, uh, cancer striking, uh, other physical infirmities, both in our congregation and in those that we love, our families. So, Lord, we just want to lift all of those up this morning. We can't name all of them by name, but you know every one. And we pray for your grace and for your mercy. We pray for your healing touch in all of these lives. And as much as we want that and desire that and pray for that, Lord, we also pray that the greater purposes that you have in mind for each one of these incidents, for every one of these occasions, that you will, in fact, work that out Bring about your marvelous and wonderful will, which we do not always understand, but we want to be faithful to submit to your greater wisdom and to your greater knowledge. We thank you, Father, for the privilege of belonging to you. We thank you for the privilege of serving you. We understand that you have given us a mission, Father, to accomplish for this period of time at this place that we will very soon answer for. We do not take that lightly. And so we pray that you will help us to not only be faithful, but Father, we pray, we pray that you'll bring about change in the lives of people as a result of placing us here. We pray that your word will do its work. We pray that you will cause us to be people of love, of commitment, of faithfulness, and that you will accomplish wonderful things that we could never ask or think because of the work that you are doing through us. Bless this time now in your word this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated and uh, please... Turn with me to Luke 21, if you're not already there. <clears throat> there's, a, uh, there's a passage in Deuteronomy 4.24 that says, where Moses told the people of Israel, for the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. The writer of the Hebrews picks that up in chapter 12, I think it's verse 29. I mean, think about that statement for a moment. The Lord your God is a consuming fire. If that's true, that's heavy, is it not? That's something to think about. We love God's love, but we will never fully understand God's love until we understand God's 
holiness. One author has said it this way. He said, God is very, very good, but God is not safe. I think we have adopted the philosophy in our culture that if there is a God at all, he certainly is safe. I don't believe that the Bible would agree with that. We need to understand that God is love But God is also a consuming fire. And we have to ask ourselves this morning, do we understand that? Do our children understand that? Martin Luther once wrote this. He said, Would to God that the world considered true that God is a consuming fire. Because it does not, people lead a wild and woolly life in this world. I mean, imagine if he could say that in the 16th century, what he would say today, right? People live a wild and woolly life in this world. People do not consider God a consuming fire, but rather some sort of stubble, a wisp of straw, or a little drop of cold water. To the world, God seems to be nothing but a sleepy, yawning fellow or a deceived husband who allows another man to sleep with his wife and acts as if he did not see it. Is that how you view God this morning? Then we must reconsider, must we not? I think Moses would say, no, God is a consuming fire. He judges sin. It's not a question of if, it is only a question of when. Now, that's all by way of introduction to where we are in this study of the Olivet Discourse that Jesus gave to his disciples to help reorient their expectations away from that the kingdom is going to be immediate and now to know there's a long intervening period of time. And so, so far already we've seen uh, several points, but we're on the the fourth one now, which is the reorientation of hope in verses 8 through 33. Five points to that eventually as we get, when we get through them. We've looked at the first two, the disturbing delay in verses 8 through 11, where Jesus characterizes the whole age that's going to become that we're living in now, the church age, is being an age of this pretty chaotic in nature, famine, wars, rumors of wars, and so on. We've seen the personal persecution that he predicts for the disciples between the time of his message and the time of the destruction of Jerusalem. So, personal promise to them and by extension to us as well. And now, this morning we want to look at this judgment on Jerusalem that we've just read about in verses 20 through 24. We've come to the point of judgment in this discourse. The fact that the nation has rejected Jesus, their Messiah, the one specifically promised by God and now sent into their very presence, that they have rejected him as a nation, will inevitably lead to judgment. It's a physical example of a spiritual truth. To reject Christ is to always bring one under the possibility of judgment. So we see, first of all, the prediction of this judgment. Jesus' prediction of judgment on the temple and by extension on to Jerusalem is what kicked off this passage of Scripture, right? Jesus predicted in verse 6 about the temple that there will not be left there one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. That led to the, that was a startling prediction that led to the question that the disciples asked in verse 7, well, teacher, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? Now in verse 20, Jesus answers that question directly. When will these things be and what will be the sign? Verse 20, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. In other words, here's your sign. When you see the city surrounded by armies, look out because desolation is just around the corner. The word desolation that's used here means destruction, means something that will become uninhabitable. Jerusalem is doomed. 
by the fact that they have rejected their Messiah. This is an unambiguous prediction of disaster that Jesus is giving here. Now, Jerusalem has had, it, had, had its share of occupation armies through the years, right? But the disaster that Jesus is predicting now exceeds anything that's happened in the past, unless you go clear back to the time of Nebuchadnezzar when he swung through Palestine between 606 and 585 B.C. There were, five, there were three specific deportations of people by Babylon from Palestine to Babylon. Not since that time has the city seen the kind of destruction that Jesus is now predicting. It happened then, after hundreds of years of warning, that if they didn't stop the idolatry that they were involved in, this is what was going to happen. But nobody believed it would really happen until it did happen. And now Jesus is predicting an even greater disaster awaits the city. I can only imagine that as they first heard this, the, the hearts of the disciples must have run cold because this went completely 180 degrees against what their expectations were at the time. Now, Jesus seals, first of all, the certainty of this prediction with this statement in verse 21. It says, Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are inside the city depart. And let not those who are out of the country enter it. Now think about that for a moment. That instruction is exactly the opposite of what you might expect, right? Normally you would tell people if armies are coming and there's going to be destruction, you need to get to the city where there's protection. Get to where the barricades are. I mean, in the Old West, where did they head when the Indians were coming, right? They headed for the forts. You want to get to where protection is. But Jesus gives exactly the opposite instruction here. His advice is credible only if the siege is actually going to succeed. His advice is credible only if the siege is actually going to succeed. In that case, the city will not be a refuge, but it will be a slaughter pen. And Jesus knows that's what the end is going to be. And so he gives this advice. He's certain of it. Even more devastating... Jesus tells why this is going to happen. And this is, I mean, this ought to send shivers up our spines as it should have the people in those times. He says in verse 22, for those are days of vengeance. And then skip to verse 23, for there will be great distress upon the earth and wrath against this people. You know, immediately you should be asking, well, whose vengeance is this that's going to be taken? Whose wrath? Is it the Romans? Because they're the ones that are going to exact this vengeance. And of course, it is the Romans, but only on the surface. You say, what do you mean? Well, look at the rest of verse 22. For these days are days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. Written where? Written in the Old Testament, of course. The Romans write the Old Testament? I don't think so. It's not the Romans whose vengeance Jesus is talking about here. It's the God who has been predicting all along, if you reject me, this is what you subject yourself to. So Jesus is saying here, the devastation and the destruction that I'm predicting is coming through the Romans, but by, by the Romans, but through the hand of God. Vengeance is his. You can't, beloved, disobey God and get away with it. You can do it for a while. You can't do it forever. You know, the, old, the, 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 the penalty for disobedience throughout the Old Testament is replete with, with, with warnings like this. Deuteronomy 32, verse 43 says, For he avenges the blood of his children and takes vengeance on his adversaries. He repays those who hate him and cleanses his people's land. Isaiah 63, verse 4, he says, For the days of vengeance was, the day of vengeance was in my heart. Hosea 9, 7, The days of punishment have come, and the days of recompense have come. Israel shall know it. Jeremiah 5, 5 29, Shall I 
not punish them for these things, declares the Lord. And shall I not avenge myself on a nation as such as this? God has long promised that there will be judgment eventually for people who disobey him. And Jesus is saying, time's up. Time's up. You've had the opportunity. Jesus has come as the Messiah, as God's personal envoy and ambassador to those people, and the time is up. If you don't think accountability <clears throat> and avenging his name is important to God, just wait. The day will come when you will understand God does avenge his name. God does take obedience seriously. God does exact from us what he has every right to exact. He is a consuming fire when his patience is exhausted. God is no pushover like we often think of him. You know, I think of people who are misunderstood as pushovers. Uh, the, the, one that, the name that always comes to my mind is Abraham Lincoln. He was one of the most originally misunderstood people because he had this, you know, he had these crude Western ways. He had this jocular kind of jokester exterior that hid the steel that lurked beneath on the inside of that man. He appointed General George McClellan to head the army in July of 1862 after the first Battle of Bull Run, the disaster that occurred there. General McClellan was at first revered by everybody. They loved him. They admired him. The troops loved him. He was a great organizer. He got everything back together, and everything was going well, except he would never move. McClellan had one great failing, which was his fear of failure. Kept him from moving. Lincoln said one time, I wish I could have the army. It's, all it's doing is it's General McClellan's bodyguard. I would use it. So Lincoln went to his house one night, November of 1862. He took Secretary of State Seward along. He took John Hay, his private secretary, along, and they went to visit McClellan. They were told that McClellan was out at a wedding, attending a wedding. So they said they would wait, expected back within the hour. So they, they were seated in a room, a sitting room, off the living room. About an hour later, McClellan came in. The servant who was there informed him that the president was there. They heard that through the door that they could see, but McClellan went on upstairs. Thirty more minutes went by. Somebody asked the servant, when is McClellan coming down to see us? And he was, they were coolly informed, McClellan has gone to bed. He's retired for the night. Now what would you do? I, I can tell you, if I were president, he wouldn't have been a general tomorrow. Five minutes later, it would have been done and signed. And that's what Hay and Seward both urged Lincoln to do. And Lincoln said, no, no, we don't need to take this personally. I need McClellan. I want him to succeed. I'll hold his, I'll hold his horse if that's what it takes to get him to succeed. And so he gave him more time. He was patient with him. But when McClellan finally failed... Repeatedly, after the Battle of Antietam, Lincoln lowered the boom. God is like that, beloved. God has great patience. He is patient. But beneath the surface, there lurks the steel and there burns the consuming fire that will one day do away with all sin of any kind. He must. Sin is not just a violation of the rules. We've said it so many times. Sin is a violation of his holy character. He could not remain God and let any sin go by. God is patient, but the time will come. He says in Isaiah 46, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish my purpose. When's he going to do that? Whenever he chooses. He's God. It won't be any later than he wants. It won't be any sooner than he chooses. We've lost that view of God. You know, we think because God doesn't strike immediately, maybe he won't strike at all. Maybe this isn't as bad as everybody says it is. Maybe I'll get away with it. We have 
such a low view of God. We have such an almost no view of sin. Sin is not even, I'm sure I've said this before, not even allowed in some pulpits. Robert Schuller said sin is just a low self-image. Not to God, it's not. Sin is not taking the character and the image of God seriously. And sin is always judged. God's past performance is intended as a warning to us. And this is a warning to us. This is why this is here. This is why this happens. Sin is real. Accountability is real. Judgment is real. It's, it's just a question of when. So this is Jesus' prediction. But number two, and I love this. I'm so glad this is here. I hope you are too. There's the compassion. The compassion of God. Why didn't judgment fall right then when the penalty was incurred? We could all ask that question. Of course, what we don't realize is we would all have been a puff of smoke a long time ago, right, if that was the case, if God operated on that principle. Why doesn't the penalty come now? It's because God is also passionate, compassionate. Look at verse, look at verse 23. Jesus says, alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, for there will be great distress on the earth and wrath against this people. I don't think he said that with an edge to it. He didn't say it like John Wayne would have said it, you know. I loved how John Wayne always said it. I don't think Jesus said it that way. He is emphasizing the terror of this time with that statement, no doubt about it. It's an earthly representation of the truth of Hebrews 10.31, which says it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And we're all going to do that. You can't avoid that. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Listen, if you don't think God matters... If you think it may just all go away, you need to contemplate that thought as you bed down tonight. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God because the time will come for all of us. But I also see in this statement that Jesus makes his compassion. Even as he announces horrendous judgment, his heart is moved with compassion. He's thinking about those who will be pregnant. Those will be nursing babies. He's thinking about these poor women and children and how they'll be caught up in all of this. His heart goes out to them. Remember how he came into the city during the triumphal entry and everybody is acclaiming him and they're waving branches and they're putting out the red carpet of their, of, their, of their robes. And what is he doing? He is sobbing uncontrollably, according to Luke 19. Remember that? He's sobbing. Oh, if you just knew this was your opportunity for peace, you've missed the day of your visitation. In rejecting me, you're rejecting the Father. In rejecting me, you're rejecting life. Jesus has compassion. God has compassion. This is the heart of God. Ezekiel 18, verse 32, God says, For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord God. So turn and live. But don't miss the turn. It's the Old Testament word for repent. Turn and live. God waits because he cares. Romans chapter 2, verse 4, he says, Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? God's demonstrated that over and over in his, world, in his word, has he not? He gave the people in Noah's time 120 years to hear that preacher of righteousness. Any of them could have joined that ark. There was no, there was no reason they couldn't have gone up there too. Nobody did. He gave the Amorites in Genesis 15, 16, four generations to repent. They would not. He gave the Egyptians 400 years plus 10 plagues to repent. They would not. 
Over and over, God has demonstrated his patience to bring people to repentance, and he did it with this evil and adulterous generation as well. They had Jesus personally for three years on the ground. They gave better than that. They had 40 years after. I, I used to wonder, why, did he, why was there 40 years between the time Jesus made this prediction and the time that the city actually fell? It's God's forbearance, is it not? It's God giving opportunity for repentance. Thankfully, many of them did. Thousands of them in Jerusalem came to faith in Christ. Wonderful thing in the book of Acts to read about it, but it's just one more opportunity for people to come to repentance. God's kindness is meant to lead to repentance. Unfortunately, most people trample on his grace and rebel against him. The fact is, none of us would have any hope at all were it not for the fact that God is compassionate, would we? The same God who is a consuming fire is also a God of consummate love. Consummate love. He loves us so much that when we could not conceivably meet his holy, perfect standard, he met it himself by sending his own son to pay the penalty for our sin. The holy fire became a holy sacrifice so that we would not have to bear the fire of his judgment by faith in him. And that's compassion. I love how a man who was a chaplain on the Queen Elizabeth II, a man named John Stoppett, he said it this way. He said, I could never myself believe in God if it were not for the cross. The only God I believe in is the one Nietzsche ridiculed as the God of the cross. In a real world of, world of pain, how could one worship a God who was immune to it? God knows our pain. God knows everything we go through. Jesus is the great high priest. Why? Simply because he has tempt, faced every temptation we do yet without sin. God bore judgment for us so that we would not have to bear it. And he delays simply to give further opportunity. But beloved, time will run out. God's patience is not infinite. September of 2012, Patty and I were in England, trip through England and parts of Scotland and Ireland with my brother John and his wife. We had a wonderful time over there together. One day we went to Hampton Court, one of the many palaces of King Henry VIII. It was a great place to visit. A lot of history there. It was wonderful, but it was a very cold and rainy day. We had to go by train, so on the way back we were at the train station getting ready to leave. And Ann and I decided, man, it's cold. We need some coffee, some hot chocolate, something. So we found out in that train station it was just up one level on a different level, so we went up there. We could see over the balcony. John and Ann were sitting down there waiting for the train to come in. The train came in, the doors opened, they got on, and we're still waiting for the coffee, right? This guy is very slow, and uh, we keep thinking, should we go down or should we wait? Well, we'll wait. Surely we just, just, just got to go down the stairs. So we waited. We started to run down the stairs, and bam, the doors closed. So we're going down. We're waving at the conductor. Uh, we think, surely he will stop the train and let us get on. Guess again, right? This is Europe. They run on time. And so we got down there just in time to look through the window and see John and Patty with hilar laughing hilariously at us. <laughs> I would say it was a highlight of Patty's trip. I'm not sure about that, but I'm, I'm suspicious. It took us an hour to find them when we finally got into London. But the point is, when the time is up, the time is up, right? We get lulled into this sense that because judgment doesn't come now and because God is kind and because he is forbearing, that nothing is ever going to happen. Not true. Not true. These people got, got, got 40 years, but when the time was up, the time was up. And so we come to the, the fulfillment. 
Jesus made the prediction. Did it happen? Here's an interesting little sidelight for those of you who are Bible students. Some people say, a few people say, no, it didn't happen, not yet. They compare verse 21, where it says, Jesus says, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. They, they find the same phrase so follow closely here. They find the same phrase in Matthew 24, verse 16, and in Mark 13, verse 14. And in both of those places, it clearly is placed in the middle of the tribulation time that's yet future even to us. So they say, well, same phrase must be future. Well, that's a good hermeneutical technique. But in this case, it's wrong. This isn't future. It's already happened. What Jesus is doing here is using the same phrase to say, let those who are in Judea uh, flee to the mountains in 70 AD when this happens, and he's going to say the same thing about the future time. Because that's just a, a prefigure, a preview of coming attractions that's going to happen later, and he's, he's applying the phrase to both times. This is with reference to what happened in AD 70 when Jer Jerusalem was destroyed. How do we know this? Several things. Number one, both Matthew and Mark refer to an abomination of desolations. An abomination of desolations is wording that comes directly out of Daniel 9. Jesus even says this was spoken of by Daniel the prophet. It is clearly in the middle of this last 70th week of Daniel, which is a tribulation time that hasn't happened yet. And as we've said before, Matthew and Mark are intent on talking about things that are even future to us, Luke is intent on talking about the thing that was coming up shortly. Jesus uses the term desolation, but not the phrase abomination of desolations. I think he is purposely, here at this point, discriminating between the events of the near-term prediction, 70 AD, and the long-term prediction, which will be out in the future. Secondly, Jesus describes great suffering in this destruction, but he does not describe it in the absolute terms that we find in Matthew and Mark. For example, in, Mark, in, in Matthew 24, verse 21, Jesus says, For then there will be great tribulation, which we saw last week refers to the last half of the tribulation period. There will be great tribulation, such as not been from the beginning of the world until now, and no, never will be. And if you read Gen Revelation 6 through 19, you'll see what he's talking about. There are things there that have never happened in the history of the world. And so that's a future time. This suffering is horrible, but it's just a foreshadowing of something that's greater yet to come. Thirdly, in verse 24, Jesus says they will, they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among many nations, many nations. Here the entire population of the city of Jerusalem will either be killed or dispersed among the nations. If you go to the end times, there's no dispersing among the nations. That's all done with. In fact, the nations are brought together in judgment before Jesus Christ at the end of that time. But after 70 AD, dispersion was a major piece of the puzzle. Finally, this prediction relates to the city and the temple that stood in Jesus' times clearly because in verse 6, that's what they're talking about. Jesus looks at the temple that's right in front of him, marvelous temple, 46 years in building up to that point, another 16 to go. He looks at that great temple and he says, there's not going to be one stone on top of another one here. He's talking about the temple that Herod built specifically. And we know that that temple was destroyed in AD 70. During the future tribulation period, there will be a temple. There's not one there today, but there will be one there then. It will be desecrated. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, God tells us that there will be a, somebody that he calls the lawless one. Probably usually term him the Antichrist who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. That's an abomination that desolates. That's something that would represent. It's the ultimate in humanity. It's, it's like Genesis 11 all over again, when man says, we will build a temple, we'll, we'll, we'll build some, a tower that gets us to God. 
This is the man standing in the place of God in the temple and saying, I am God. I've gotten there. The ultimate in humanity. Smartest, wisest, most sophisticated man in history will demand to be worshipped as God, and it's an unthinkable desecration. But the interesting thing is there's never any indication that that temple at the end of time will be destroyed. Now, maybe, I don't know, but it doesn't say so in the Bible. In fact, we go into the, we go into the thousand-year reign of Christ right after that, and there's a temple there. But whether it is or not, it would not be Herod's temple. Herod's temple is the one that Jesus referenced when he said that not one stone would be left on top of another. So yes, this prophecy of Jesus is fulfilled to the letter. Just as we saw when we looked at it in Luke 19. By A.D. 66, this is all Jesus is talking to the disciples in most likely A.D. 30. By A.D. 66, the Romans had gotten so fed up with Jewish intransigence and, and Jewish people constantly harping at them about one thing or another that they decided it was time to bring an end to all of this. And so they sent a general named Vespasian to Israel to take care of things. He started the work, but very quickly he got word that Nero, who was the emperor at the time, had committed suicide. And so Vespasian hightailed it back to Rome there was a period of real chaos in Rome, four emperors in, in a single year, in a single 12-month period in Rome, before things finally settled down. Vespasian became the new emperor in Rome, and he sent his son Titus to Palestine to try and take care of things that had really gotten out of hand by that time. Now Josephus, the Jewish historian, tells us what happens next, the horrors of the siege that followed. It began in April of AD 70 at the time of the Passover. So you had all kinds of Jewish people in the city that didn't live there at the time. And he set siege to it. He built barricades around the city. And despite numerous opportunities to give up, to surrender, the Jews simply would not do so. So this siege went on for five months under absolutely ghastly conditions. It, kind of, it reminds you, if you've read anything about the Civil War, you know about the, the siege that uh, happened, uh, oh, the city escapes me, on the uh, Mississippi River now that Grant laid siege to, but the conditions were very much the same. In Jerusalem at this time, the siege went on for five months. Famine raged the city. Pretty soon people were being st stacked up like, like firewood along the streets of the city. Women were eating first rats, anything they could find, and then their own children stay alive. Inevitably, the Romans broke through the walls of Jerusalem and retribution was absolutely uh, brutal. Thousands of people, including children, were murdered outright. Others were taken away and sold into slavery and dispersed among the nations. Roman soldiers were so outraged that even though Titus had given the instruction that nobody was to destroy the temple, he wanted, what did he want to do with it? He wanted to make it a shrine to Caesar, who, remember, was his own father. But some soldiers set it on fire anyway, either by accident, depending on who you read in history or not, but at least it was set on fire. And all kinds of gold and silver implements were already part of the temple, and many others had been brought in for storage there and as the fire burned hot, it all melted down. And pretty soon it was running through the cracks of the stones. And so the greedy soldiers came with great bars to pry the massive stones out of place so they could get every bit of the gold and silver that they could find. And before they were done, not one stone was left on, on top of another except the foundation of that Temple Mount is still in place. You can still see it today, the great stones that they put there. But you can also see all the ones that, not all of them, but many of the ones that came down. You can see the dents in the sidewalk. I think I've shown you pictures of that before. First century sidewalks, you can see the dents where the stones were brought down on the sidewalk. It all happened. Judgment delayed is not judgment denied. The city fell. 
just like Jesus said. But there is hope. This passage has hope. It has hope for the church. It has hope for Israel, for both. I know there are a lot of people that want to put the two together. I don't think you can. But I see hope for both here, however you want to look at it. This passage is about judgment, but it also is about hope. Did anybody escape this judgment? Yes, they did. Do you know who it was? It was the Christians. It was the people of the church of Jerusalem who knew the words of Jesus. Probably at least a couple of the Gospels had been written by this time, but in any case, the oral transmittal of the words of Jesus from generation to generation had been passed along, and everybody knew that Jesus had predicted this and said, when the armies are outside and surrounding the city, you better get out. And the Christian people who took that seriously left. They crossed the Jordan River. They set up shop in a place called Pila, across on the other side, and they actually set up a church over there. And the Christian people survived because they believed the Word of God. It's kind of an illustration of the fact that, you know, kind of a physical illustration of a spiritual deliverance. It's available through Christ. But there's other hope here as well for the nation of Israel. Look at verse 24. Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Now, why would Jesus say that? Do you see the implications of that statement? It implies that there's going to be a future for Israel. Despite the fact that judgment is coming, it's going to be for a certain period of time. It's going to be for a time that he calls the period of the Gentiles, the times of the Gentiles. It's the times in which we live, beloved. We're the times of the Gentiles, the church age. It's not that there aren't Jewish people in the church who are believers and Jew Jewish people in the world. But it's the times of the Gentiles. But that time is going to end. You study Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, and you'll see that the, that the prediction of the end of the world that, will, that is coming there, that Jesus' second coming will result in Israel finally recognizing the Messiah that they rejected the first time around and accepting him the second time around. It says this in Zechariah to give us an idea of this. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. God says, I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy so that when they look on me, this is Jesus talking about his second coming, when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child. Someday the nation will become regenerate under, by, and by the grace of God. They will look on the coming Jesus and they will recognize him as the one that their ancestors have rejected and in mass the nation of Israel will return in faith to Jesus Christ. It's the end of the time of the Gentiles. It's the beginning of a new era for Israel. And you know what? The fact that Israel is in the land today since 1948 as a nation leads to the possibility of this at any moment. God not only predicted the dispersal of Israel among the lands, he, he, he predicted the coming of them back together in Israel. I think it's too soon to say this is it. But I think it's very possible that this is the time when Israel is a, as a nation will be revisited by their Messiah. And there will be a turning to him so how do we conclude this? Well, listen this way. What's true for Israel is also as a nation is true for any individual. Because God is a consuming fire. Judgment day for unbelievers is a certainty. Did you catch that? It's not a possibility. It's a certainty. Just as the nation faced judgment as a certainty, so will everyone who rejects Jesus Christ. Those in Jerusalem who believed in Jesus and his word were saved. Those who followed the world's way were swallowed up in judgment. Same principle applies spiritually. John Wesley, the great evangelist. You know, I think one of the reasons that motivated him in his ministry was this. He was about six years old and there was a fire in his home 
and he happened to be on the second floor. Couldn't find a way out. He hollered out. Somebody saw him hollering out the window. A couple of neighbors came by. One of them stood on top of another, and they managed to get him out of the building before he burned and it burned to the ground, just before the roof collapsed. He always referred to himself thereafter as a brand pulled from the fire. A brand plucked from the fire. And so, beloved, all of us can be a brand plucked from the fire of God's judgment. But make no mistake, it is coming. It is who God is. It is a part of his character. It is, it is his love that in some ways dictates his judgment. Because he loves, he will not allow sin to go on forever. Because he loves those who will turn to him, he will make sure that there is a time and there is a place and there is a paradise and all the things we long for will be true. But in order for that to be true, there has to be judgment on that which will not submit to him, which will not bow to him. And so God is a consuming fire. How do we escape that? By accepting the gift of his love, the forgiveness and cleansing that he offers through Jesus Christ, who faced the fire of the Father so that we wouldn't have to. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word. Thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, the fact that things in the past have happened exactly as you said, exactly as you predicted, leads us to believe that things in the future will do the same, that a day is coming, that you've given us now a, an extended period of time in which to repent, in which to turn to you, that you have been kind and that you have been patient, that you have been forbearing. Lord, I pray that we have turned to you. pray that those who are here this morning who have not done so would do so right now. Lord, may they not walk out of here without turning their heart and life to you, acknowledging their sin, acknowledging their need of you, acknowledging their faith in the, in the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ in their place, and saying, I want that, and I ask you for it. Would you please cause that to happen? And then, Lord, uh, pray for those of us who know you, who have come to that moment of faith. We pray that this will be a reminder to us as well of how serious your intentions are, of how faithful you are to your word, including the ones, the parts of it that we maybe don't like as well that in fact it is the most loving thing you can do to one day clear out the whole universe of the sin which has been here for so long. We look forward to that day. But Lord, we want to see as many people as possible coming to you in the meantime. So give us a heart of compassion. Help us to have the heart of God, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Help us to do everything we know to help others come to know you. And we will thank you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.